play together one of the best CRPGs of all time. Hi, I'm Nick, and this is Classical Studies on Retro Games with Nick. Um, in this uh, series, this sub-series, we're going to be playing through Planescape Torment. Um, as you can see, we're cheating a little bit, we're playing the Enhanced Edition, but I, I just really did my best and tried everything that I could, but the virtual machine um, is just a little too slow in running the original game, uh, mostly in the cutscenes. Uh, the gameplay is fine and performs at 100%, uh, but the cutscenes slow down and dip in like 60% performance rate. Uh, and the most, most, the main problem with that is really just the sound. Like, uh, I cannot abide to have cutscenes with like crackling sounds that sort of repeats and stutters, right? Um, and I tried running the, um, original version through GOG, but it doesn't play nice with windowed mode and with the capturing mode, and so I have to just go back to the Enhanced Edition. Um, we're gonna minimize the effect of the Enhanced Edition. And it seems that the Enhanced Edition actually has very few modifications made. Um, let's go through the options just in case... Um, cause I do- I do want to try and play this pretty close to what the original would be. I think a lot of the stuff is actually modern. But the always run is nice. Uh, you know, let's- let's maybe not mess with anything right off the start. Um, but one thing we do want to do is definitely watch, uh, the movies. So this is a more modern version of the original. Um, it is, uh, instead of having TSR logo, it now of course has the Dungeons & Dragons logo and Bean Dog. Uh, and let's watch the opening movie together. Um, so I've heard a lot of this game. I've never actually played through this game, so I'm really excited to explore this, uh, with all of you. Creepy obelisk. Ooh, I didn't like that. It looks like our wife or something. Probably our wife. Dead. And accusing us of stuff. Let me actually lower the volume a little bit more. Alright, well, that's definitely an interesting thing to start off the adventure. Um, we're gonna keep everything else the same. Yeah, we're gonna keep everything else the same. Okay. Um, okay, let's uh, get ready to start. Oh, we gotta assign stats here, huh? So to my understanding, this is a game that you can more or less play and finish without actually fighting. It's based on D&D, I think, first edition D&D, like many Infinity Engine games, but you don't actually have to fight. You can typically talk your way through situations. So let me boost charisma. Increase con a little bit. 
protect because it does armor class. Um, bonus to XP and recalling things, yeah, sure. Uh, strength, uh, oh, let's wait. More dialogue options. Yeah, I think I will make the actual combat stuff not as strong. Give wisdom, intellect, and charisma a little boost. Alright, let's try this. Uh, if we regret it, we can change it and restart it, I guess. We'll see, but... Um, without having read anything about this game, based on what they're talking about and the little that I know, I think this is a good choice. So let's go ahead and accept. Better for sure. Well, who are you? Who am I? How about you, sir? Who are you? I don't know. I can't remember. Can't remember your name? <laughs> well, next time you spend a night in the burg, go easy on the bub. Name's Mord. I'm trapped here too. Trapped? Yeah. Since you haven't had time to get your legs yet, here's the chant. I've tried all the doors, and this room is locked tighter than a chastity belt. We're locked, Tim. Where? What is this place? It's called the Mortuary. It's a big black structure with all the architectural charm of a pregnant spider. The Mortuary? What? Am, am I dead? Not from where I'm standing. You got scars of plenty, though. It looks like some burg paint, uh, painted you with a knife. All the more reason to give this place the laugh before whoever carved you up comes back to finish the job. Scars? Uh, how bad are they? Well, the carvings on your chest aren't too bad, but the ones on your back weren't the pauses. Say, looks like you had a whole tattoo gallery on your back, Chief. It spells it something. Tattoos on my back? What did they say? Yeah, looks like it gave me directions. Morty clears his throat. Let's see, it starts with... I know you feel like you've been drinking a few kegs of stick wash, but you need to center yourself. Among your possessions is a journal that will shed some light on the matter. Barry can fill you in on the rest of the chant if he's not in the dead book already. Barry? Does it say anything else? Yeah, there's a bit more. More two pauses. Let's see, it goes on. Don't lose the journal or we'll be up the sticks again. Whatever you do, do not tell anyone who you are or what happens to you, or they'll put you on a quick pilgrimage to the crematorium. Do what I tell you. Read the journal, then find Farrah. No wonder my back hurts. There's a damn novel written there. It's part of the journal I'm supposed to have with me. Was there one with me while I was lying there? No, you were stripped of the skins when you arrived here. Besides, look like you got enough of a journal penned on your body. What about Farah? Do you know him? Nobody I know. But then again, I don't know many people. Still, some burks got to know where to find Farah. Uh, once we get out of here, that is. How do we get out of here? Well, all the doors are locked, so we need the key. Chances are, one of the walking corpses in this room has it. Walking corpses? Yeah, the mortuary keeps, uh, keepers use dead bodies as cheap labor. Corpses are dumb stones, but they're harmless and won't attack you unless you attack first. I is there some other way? I don't just want to kill them for a key. What, you think it's gonna hurt their feelings? They're dead. If you want a bright side to this, if you kill them, at least they'll have a rest before their keepers raise them up to work again. Well, alright, I'll take one of them down and get the key. Uh, note, search the shelves in the room for a weapon to attack the zombies with. When you find one, go to the inventory screen, the backpack button in the lower right, and arm yourself. If you wish to examine any items you find, right-click on them on the inventory screen. 
All right, I'll look for one. Come on, let's stay. Scorpses are slow as molasses, but getting punched by one of them is like being kissed by a battering ram. If they start getting an edge on you, remember you can run and they can't. Use it to keep some distance if you need to recover. To run, either toggle run on the option screen or hold down the shift key and left in the area you want to run to. If you're in danger of dying, use running to keep your distance from the zombies while you recover. Alright, thanks for the advice. Um, okay. Let me do a couple of things. Lower all the volumes, except for the voice one. Uh, let's activate the always run. Um, and let's make a quick save. Uh, oh, we save. Uh, here, I guess. Can I rename this? Just started the game. Alright, let's start by zooming out a little bit, since uh, I see that when we were zoomed in, the graphics tend to blend a little. Okay. Um, I'm gone. So, to my understanding, let's actually just dick around the menus a little bit first. Don't want to part with that. We can switch eyeballs. We have a fist. We are a fighter with armor class 10. I assume that this technically goes by um, AD&D rules, so that's first. Uh, okay, parentheses, uh, or tangent. I never really understood the difference between first and second edition. It seems to me that second edition is really just like 1.5-ish, and then three really made a big difference. Uh, but yeah, I assume that we're a fighter and the armor classes uh, account for in terms of our original D&D. &D. Uh, he has Bite. He is also a fighter. And... I don't know what this does. Items, more fells, only have our fists as a weapon. Oh, the, there's a clock running in the game. Okay, interesting. Pretty member slots. It's our money, I suspect. A little AI. Entry screen. Map screen where you can show the walkable areas. That's the that's nice. Journal. Find Sarah. From a work read in the description to, uh, sorry, of the directions to it on my back, I need to find someone named Ferret. I'm not sure what to start looking. Hopefully asking some of the locals in a strange place will allow me to track him down. And then we are supposed to find a missing journal. Which, of course, is missing. Morte is a talking skull. His sole weapon seems to be his mouth, whether by taunting or biting. He seems to be along for the ride, whether you want him around or not. We are somewhat curious as to how he's able to float around. Nameless one. We are nameless. We awoke on a slab in the mortuary in Sigil, covered in scars and tattoos, your memory gone. Who has done this to you and why? You don't know. Yet. But you're going to find out. Zombie male. Zombies are mindless corpses animated by necromancy. Unlike skeletons, zombies have still have a great deal of flesh attached to their frame, and this is both an advantage and a disadvantage. It makes them tougher and stronger than skeletons, but at the same time, rigor mortis hinders their movement, making them much slower than a normal human being. While the zombies move and attack very slowly, their great strength becomes apparent when they catch a target. Their blows are capable of killing a normal human being with a single punch. Yeah. Zombie worker. This corpse's head lolls back and forth on its shoulder. During my angled on the neck, it looks like this man may have been hanged. 
The number 825 has been painted on the side of the head. Examine the corpse, see if it's carrying a key. It's carrying nothing. But your habit tonight is that sand are heavily bandaged. The bandages might be usable if the corpse was disposed of first. Uh, guess you don't have the key. You don't happen to know which of your other corpse friends has the key out of this place. Chief, they can hear you, alright? You're dead. But you're dead, and you're talking to me. Okay. Yeah, but I'm special. That's gonna kill my sister for life. These corpses here, Rote rolls his eyes. They probably didn't have much personality to begin with. I see. Morte. Look, Chief. Watching you trying to swap the Chan with these corpses isn't doing much for my morale. Let's leave the corpse stock for the bar of these, alright? Alright, let's go. So, my goal is still to try and not fight. Uh, this one has 72 covered in his forehead, the lips are stitched close, the faint smell of formaldehyde emanates from the body. Examine the corpse. This corpse looks like the one with the key. It's holding it tightly in its left hand, its thumb and forefinger locked around in a death grip. Looks like you'll need to act the corpse's hand uh, to get the key. I need the key, corpse. Looks like you're not long for this world. Done. I guess we had to fight somewhat. This type of rails running through the whole room. It feels like the slabs in the room can be moved around in these rails. Red blood covers the slab surface. Red blood not remains. Scalpel. Uh, and equip it. Just in case. All right. Where is locked? We need a key. I'll take the bandages. Scarps looks like someone turned it inside out. A machine on the head of the table has peeled the skin of the forehead to give direct access to the skull. Beautiful. No, nothing there. Uh, covered in blood, completely gutted. Advice, Chief. I'd keep it quiet from here on. No need to put any more corpses in the dead book than necessary, especially the fum. But skilling them might draw the caretakers here. Me. Um, I don't think you mentioned it before. Who are these caretakers? Morte. Call themselves the Dustmen. You can't miss them. They have an obsession with black and rigor mortis of the face. They're an added bunch, adult bunch of ghoulish death worshippers. They believe everybody should die. Sooner better than later. I'm confused. Why do these dustmen care if I escape? Aren't you listening? I said the dusties believe everybody's gotta die sooner and better than later. You think the corpses you've seen here are happier in a dead book than out of it? Corpses I've seen here. Where did they all come from? Okay. Death visits the plains every day, chief. These shamblers are all that's left the poor sods who sold their bodies to the caretakers after death. Uh like me, who are these caretakers? Oh no, we already read this. Uh, before he said something about making sure I didn't kill any female corpses. Why? Okay. Well, are you serious? Look, Chief, these dead shits are the last chance for a couple of hardy bashers like us. We need to be chivalrous. No hacking them up for keys, no lopping their limbs off, things like that. Last chance? What are you talking about? Okay. Chief, they are dead. We're dead. See where I'm going, eh, eh? You can't be serious. Morty. Chief, already got an opening line with these limping ladies. We've all died at least once. 
We have something to talk about. So I appreciate man with our kind of death experience. Wait, didn't you say before that I'm not dead? Okay. Well, alright. You might not be dead, but I am. And from where I'm standing, I wouldn't mind sharing a coffin with some of these fine seeming cadavers I see here. Mortis starts clacking his teeth as if in anticipation. Of course, the caretaker is about to part with them first, and that's not likely. Um, alright, I'll try and remember that. Morty. Look, Chief, it's obvious you're still a little addled after your kiss with death, so I got two bits of advice for you. One, if you've got questions, ask me, alright? Alright, if I have any questions, I'll ask you. Second, if you're half as forgetful as you seem to be, start writing stuff down whenever you come across something that might be important. Jot it down so you don't forget. If I had the journal I was supposed to have with me, I'd do that. Morty. Start a new one then, Chief. No loss. There's plenty of parchment around and, and ink here. Sorry. Plenty of parchment and ink around here to last you. Hmm. Alright. Couldn't hurt. I'll make a new one then. Morty. You have to keep track of your movements. If you ever start to get clouded in important things like who you are, or more importantly, who I am, use it to refresh your memory. Alright. I got it. Let's go. Updated my journal. Day zero, R7. My new, my original journal has gone missing, so I've started a new one. A place called the Mortuary. I don't know who I am, what I'm doing here, or even how I got here. The only person I encountered was a chattering skull called Morte. While he was checking my wounds, he discovered a set of directions tattooed on my back. I know you feel like you've been drinking a few kegs of sticks wash, but you need to center yourself. Among your possessions is a journal that'll shed some light on the dark of the matter. Farad can fill you in on the rest of the chant. If he's not in the dead book already. If you don't lose the journal, we'll be up to sticks again. And whatever you do, do not tell anyone who you are or what happens to you. Or they'll put you in a quick pilgrimage to the crematorium. Do what I tell you. Read the journal, then find Farad. Did I leave this message for myself? It looks like I'll need to find this Farad and my journal. Alright. A shambling corpse gazes at you with vacant eyes. Her skin is paper thin, almost wispy. It's like someone draped a sheet of cobwebs across her frame. The number 594 has been scratched onto her forehead with a charcoal pencil. So, doing anything later? The corpse continues to stare at you. Farewell, then. Morton. You see the way she was looking at me, huh? You see that? The way she was following the curve of my occipital bone? You mean the black eyed beyond the grave stare? What? Oh, are you blind? She was scouting me out. It was shameless, like the way she wanted me. Um. Let's play along with it. Why do you need to go away, maybe? She was obviously too distracted by me to pay attention to some stupid bobbing head with a big mouth. What? You? Yeah, right. Trust me. Shits beyond the grave don't care about all the physicality and I've got a body and I'm all scarred and tough looking. No one gets with spirit. That's me, chief. You? Corpses like you as are as common as copper. Whatever, Morte, let's go. Uh, this one has the number 626. Uh, the left side of this one's face looks as if it was caved in with a club. Her flesh sags and bruise swollen clumps over a ruined skull. Uh, nasty wound you've got there. Uh, this corpse is swimming around the triangular path. Once it reaches one of the corners of the triangle, it pauses, then turns and staggers toward the next corner. It has 965 tattoos on the side of his skull. As you approach, it halts and stares at you. Morte. <laughs> Looks like someone forgot to tell the sun to stop walking the rule of threes. What do you mean? Morte. These corpses don't have much left in the attic, so they can do more than one task at a time. If they're told to do something, they'll keep doing it until someone tells them to stop. This poor son probably finished some task and they forgot to tell him. Uh, who gives their, them their commands? Morte. Either one of the caretakers here, or else whatever necromancer raised them out of the dead book. Probably one of the caretakers here. 
Dirty ones can need the cheap labor, after all. I see. What was it you said before about the rule of threes? Updated my journal. Forte. Eh? Well, the rule of threes is one of those laws about the planes, about things tending to happen in threes. Or everything's composed of three parts. Or there's always three choices and so on and so forth. You don't sound like you hold much faith in it. Forte. It's a lot of wash, if you ask me. If you look for a number, any number, and try to attach some great meaning to it, you're gonna find plenty of coincidences. Um... Understood, I wish you examined the zombie a bit more. Uh, so, why are you walking in a triangle? Corpse stares at you blank. Leave it in peace. Uh, Mort mentioned something about the rule of threes. Apparently, some people believe everything tends to happen in three, and they attach great meaning to the number. Going well, I guess there's not really anything else to do. Uh, here, oh, by the way, what's, uh... What, what's her button for a quick save? Oh, a sentence, there we go. Um... These are spell... No, misclaim is what I want to click. Quick save is... Q? Okay. Yes. Uh, corpse is shuffling from slab to slab, bandaging the corpses lying there. The number three and six is carved into his left tampon and slips are stitched closed. Notice the corpse is carrying a roll of bandages in its hand. The bandages look usable. Uh, mind if I borrow these bandages? Just stares at me. I'll try to take them. You snake your hand out and take the raw bandages from the corpse's hand. The corpse doesn't even seem to notice. He continues going through the motions of bandaging the bodies. Um, just apologies to him, but yeah. Um, female corpse is making her rounds from slab to slab in the room. Her hair is knotted in a long braid and looped around her neck like a noose. Someone has stenciled the number 1096 onto her forehead and her lips have been stitched closed. Uh, nice braid. Oh, that's, uh, that's one of those people. Number 121 has been inked on the forehead of this corpse, and the ink has run down its eyes, checks, uh, cheeks, and jaws. As you follow the ink tears down the corpse's face, you notice that it has run into the stitching, sealing the corpse's lips, and has caught on what looks like the corner of a note stuck in the corpse's mouth. Uh, try and take it out. The note has mingled with the ichor in the zombie's mouth. If you tried to pull the paper out through the cross stitches, it would tear the paper to shreds. I can have the corpse to get all of it. Uh, to get the, to get at it looks like it would destroy the note. You need to find a delicate way to remove the stitches before removing the note. I will use the scalpel. You deftly slice through the stitches, sealing the corpse's mouth, and the jaw sags open. Carefully pull the note from the corpse's mouth. Despite the condition of the paper, the writing on it still appears legible. Uh, to read notes, books, and scrolls, post them in your inventory, then right-click on them to bring on their information. Alright. <laughs> note from Corpse 1201. This is a foul-smelling note retrieved from the mouth of one of the mortuary zombies. It looks like it was sewn into the corpse's mouth by accident. Despite its condition, the writing is legible. Please, to whatever dustman reads this, I beg of you. I know of my legal obligation under the terms of the dead contract, but I am prepared to offer more than my signing fee if you will cremate my body rather than raising it. I have arranged for this note to be left with my body upon my death. If you are reading this, then please use this note as instructed and accept the results in exchange for my contracted duty. Let my contract number serve as the key. It looks like the corpse was too late to prevent the raising, but you notice that beneath the writing and diagram, it looks like directions for folding the parchment into strange patterns. Uh, click use. Uh, okay. False mounting note is a strange diagram inscribed beneath the writing. It looks as if it's instructing you to fold the corners of the note so the points are touching the center. 
There is a series of strange marks in each corner. One mark in the upper right, two in the lower right, three in the lower left, and no in the upper left. This is Corpse 1201. He said his number would be the P. So we do upper right. Two in the lower right. Uh, upper left when there's no marks. Uh, the upper right unfolds by itself, resuming its normal position. And then we fold the upper right back in the center. As you fold the upper right corner back in the center, the lower left corner mirrors the action until all the corners touch in the center. You watch for a moment, and the corners of the paper raise up, turning the note into a small four-sided paper pyramid. Open the sides of the pyramid. Peel back the sides of the pyramid, and the paper disintegrates to dust. Inside is a small triangle-shaped earring. Catches the light and gleams brightly. We'll take it. Yes. Uh, we need to identify it uh, before we can figure out what it does, but we'll wear it. All right, let's quick save it before we talk to this guy. This book is huge. It contains thousands of names. This crowd, uh, no. This crowd looks very old. His skin is wrinkled and has a slight trace of yellow like old parchment. Charcoal gray eyes lie with an angular face, and his large white beard flows down the front of his robes like a waterfall. His breathing is ragged and irregular, but even his occasional coughing does not slow the scratching of his quill pen. Greetings. Morten. Whoa, Chief, what are you doing? I was going to speak with a scribe. He might know something about how I got here. Morten. Look, rattling your bone box with dusties should be the last thing. Doll. Before Morte can finish his rant, the scrap begins coughing violently. After a moment of two, the coughing spell dies down and the scrap's breathing resumes its ragged wheeze. Morte. And we especially shouldn't be swapping the chan with sick dusties. Come on, let's leave. If we were leave this place to laugh. We'll give this place to laugh, the bet. No. Before Morte can finish, the scrap's gray eyes flicker to you. The weight of years hangs heavy upon me, restless one. He places down his quilt. But I do not yet count deafness among my ailments. Restless one, do, do you know me? Know you? I... There is a trace of bitterness in the scrap's voice as he speaks. I have never known you, restless one. No more than you have known yourself. He is silent for a moment. For you have forgotten, have you not? Who are you? As always, the question. And the wrong question, as always. He bows slightly, but the movement suddenly sends him into a bout of coughing. I... He pauses for a moment, catches his breath. I... am Dahl. Perhaps you can answer some questions for me, Dahl. Updated my journal. Very well. What would you wish to know? Is it the journal? No. What is this place? Dahl. You are in the mortuary, restless one. Again, you have... Come. Before he can finish, Dal breaks into a fit of coughing. After a moment, he calms himself and his breathing resumes its ragged wheeze. This is the waiting room for those about to depart the shadow of this life. Uh, tell me more about it, I guess. This is where the dead are brought to be interred or cremated. It is our responsibility as dustmen to care for the dead, those who have left the shadow of life and walked the path of true death. Dal's voice drops in concern. Your wounds must have extracted a heavy toll if you do not recognize this place. It is almost your home. Shadow of life? Yes, a shadow. You see, restless one, this life, it is not real. Your life, my life, they are shadows. Flickerings are what, well, of what life once was. This life is where we end up after we die. And here we remain. Trapped. Caged. Until we can achieve the true death. True death? True death is non-existence. You stare at the void of reason, of sensation, of passion. Dal coughs, then gives a ragged breath. A state of purity. Sounds like oblivion. Why would anyone you want that? No. It is worse than remaining in the shadow of what life once was? I think not. 
Um, Shadow of Liar? Uh, yes, a shadow. You see, Restless One, this life, it is not real. Okay, but we already read this. Okay. What makes you think this life isn't real? What makes you think this life is real? Look inside yourself. Do you not feel somewhat lacking? Dal shakes his head. This is the purgatory. There is only sorrow here. Misery. Torment. These are not the elements that make up life. They are part of the cage that traps us in this shadow. Cages? How? Dal shakes his head. Fashions carry weight. They anchor many to this shadow of life. As long as one clings to emotion, they will continually reborn into this life, forever suffering, never knowing the purity of true death. Um, I see. How does one escape the cycle of rebirth and achieve this true death? Kill your passions. Strip yourself of the need for sensation. When you are truly cleansed, then the cycle of rebirth will end and you will achieve peace. Doll sighs. Sounds like a death rattle in his throat. Past these shelves of ours, past the eternal boundary, lies the peace that all souls seek. The eternal boundary? The boundary between the shadow of life and the true death. I see, I had some other questions. Um, how did I get here? Dahl snorts in contempt as if you found some memory repugnant. Your moldy chariot ferried you to the mortuary, restless one. You would think you were royalty based on the number of loyal subjects that lay stinking and festering upon the card that carried you. I got here on a cart? Updated my journal. Yes. Your body was somewhere in the middle of the heap, sharing its fluids with the rest of the mountain of corpses. Dal breaks into another violent fit of coughing, finally catching his breath minutes later. Your seneschal Farahan was, as always, pleased to accept a few moldy coppers to dump the lot of you at the mortuary gate. Who is this Farahan? He is a collector of the dead. Dal draws a ragged breath and continues. We have such people in our city that scavenge the bodies of those that have walked the path of true death and bring them to us so that it may be interred properly. But where can I find this ferret? If events persist as they have, Restless One, you have a much greater chance of ferret finding you and bringing you to us again before you find whatever ooze puddle he wallows in this time. Nevertheless, I must find him. A slight, a slight warning creeps into Dahl's tone. Do not seek out Farad, Restless One. I am certain that it will simply come full circle again, with you none the wiser and Farad a few coppers richer. Accept death, Restless One. Do not perpetuate your cycle of misery. Um. If I ask him Updated about it again. My journal. Okay. I have to find him again. Do you know where he is? Dahl is silent for a moment. When he finally speaks, he seems to do so reluctantly. I do not know under which gutter stone Farad lairs at the moment, but I imagine he must be found somewhere beyond the mortuary gates, in the hive. Perhaps someone there will know where you can find him. Doesn't sound, he doesn't sound like you like Farad much. Dal. There are some I respect, Bristol's one. Dal takes a ragged breath and steadies himself. Farad is not one of them. He wears his ill repute like a badge of honor and takes liberties with the possessions of the dead. He is a knight of the post, cross of the post cross reading filth of the lowest sort. No, maybe the correct reading is he's a knight of the post, cross reading filth of the lowest sort. Knight of the post? Oh, knight of the post, Dalkoffs. A thief. All Farad brings to our walls comes stripped of little less of their dignity than they possessed in life. Farad takes whatever he may pry from their stiffening fingers. Does Farad take anything from me? Dal pauses considering. Most likely. Are you missing anything, especially anything of value? His voice drips as he frowns. Not that Farad would take exception to anything that wasn't physically grafted to your body, and sometimes even that's not enough to give us a greeting on pause. Are you missing a journal? A journal? It was of any value, then it, like, it is likely it lies in Farad's hands. Alright, um... Can you tell me how to get out of here? Doll. Oh. Hmm. The front gate is the most obvious exit, but it will not let anyone other than dustmen pass. Doll breaks into a ragged cough, then continues. 
One of the guides by the front gate has a key to it, but it's unlikely it will open it for you unless you're extremely persuasive. Uh, do you know who I am? Updated my journal. I know scant little of you, restless one. I know little more of those that have journeyed with you and who are now alive in our keeping. The Alsais. I ask that you no longer ask others to join with you, restless one. Where you walk, so walks misery. Let your burden be your own. There are others who have journeyed with me, and they are here. Updated my journal. Do you not know the woman's corpse and turn in the memorial hall below? I thought that she had traveled with you in the past. Now it looks like he is about to start coughing again and catches his breath. Am I mistaken? Um, where is her body? The Northwest Memorial Hall on the floor below us. Take the beers there. Her name should be on one of the memorial plaques. They have that will revive your memory. I don't know. I don't recall ever traveling with a woman. The hall makes no response to this. It simply stares at you in silence. Uh, where are the others? Doubtless there are, but I know not their names, nor where they lie. One such as you has left the path many have walked, and few have survived. They all gestures around you. All that come here. They must have traveled with you once. Uh, other questions? Um, what do you do here? I am a scribe, a cataloger of the, all the shells that come to the mortuary. Dal coughs again, then takes a deep breath. As long as the stream of corpses flows through the mortuary, I shall remain at my post. You say that I have been here more than once. How is it that the dustmen do not recognize me? Updated my journal. I am the one that catalogs the shells that come to our halls, restless one. Dal breaks into a fit of coughing and steadies himself. Only I see the faces of those that lie upon our slabs. The dark of your existence lies safe with me. Uh, tell me more about the mortuary? No, okay. So, actually, uh, Sigil and Woods when did not ask. Sigil is our fair city. Yes, the wounds that decorate your body. They look as if they would have sent the lesser men on the path of true death, and yet it seems that many of them have healed already. Falcops bounds for a moment then steadies himself. But those are only the surface wounds. Only surface ones? What do you mean? Updated my journal. I speak of the wounds in the mine. You have forgotten much, have you not? They have your true wounds run much deeper than the scars that decorate your surface. Dalkoff's again, but it is something that only you would know for certain. You sound ill, are you not well? I am now close to the true death, restless one. It will not be long before I pass beyond the eternal boundary and find the peace I have been seeking. Tire of this mortal's fear. Thou gives ragged sigh. The plains hold no more wonders for one such as I. Are you certain there may be some way I could help you? I do not wish to live forever nor live again, restless one. I could not bear it. So be it. Farewell, Dal. As turn to leave, Dal speaks. Know this. I do not envy you, restless one. To be reborn as you would be. To be reborn as you would be a curse that I could not bear. You must come to terms with it. At some point, your path will return you here. Thou coughs the sun rattling in his throat. It is the way of all things flesh and bone. Then perhaps we'll meet again, Del. That was really cool and a lot of information. Um, uh, okay. I met a sickly scrap named Dal in the mortuary. He knew I had forgotten myself before I even spoke to him. Did I know him before I lost my memories? I was hoping you get some answers, but this place seems to breed more and more questions. Apparently, Farad dis delivered my body here in a cart, along with a heap of other corpses. Was I actually dead when he did this? Dal told me that Farad can be found beyond the mortuary in some place called the Hive. He didn't seem to want me to go haunting for Fira, but then again, he's not the one who's lost his memories and woken up from the dead, so he can keep his opinions to himself. Dal suggested I ask some of the people in the hive where I can find Fira. Uh, I asked Dal if he knew me, and he responded that he knew little about me, and even less about the companions that he had traveled with me in the past. Apparently their bodies lie in the mortuary. Perhaps seeing them will cause my memories to resurface. Dal told me one of the women who journeyed with me is interred in a memorial hall on the first floor of the mortuary. 
Uh, Dell told me to weren't responsible for keeping my return visits to the mortuary secret from... Sorry. Dal told me he is the one responsible for keeping my return visits to the mortuary a secret from the rest of the dustmen. Since he's described in the receiving room, he is the only... He's one of the only ones who sees my body when it arrives here. And Dal suggested that the wounds I have suffered are minor in comparison to the wounds in my mind. Even went so far as to suggest that the wounds I've suffered may be responsible for my loss of memory, and that the mental damage may be much greater than amnesia. The thought makes me uneasy. I wouldn't mind hearing some good news every once in a while. Oh, here's a picture of Dal. The elder this crab looks very old. His skin is wrinkled and he has a slight trace of yellow, like old parchment. Dead charcoal gray eyes lie with an, with an angular face. A non-human face, as the ears narrow to points. A large white beard flows down the front of his black robes like a waterfall. He coughs occasionally. The book he works in front of his in front of is huge and seems to contain many names. Zombie female. Um same description as zombie male. A different picture. Burp says the numbers 1094 carved into its forehead, mouth and the shoe tightly shut, and a chemical reek of fresh formaldehyde hangs in an overpowering cloud around it. Despite the pallid sunken features and lifeless milky eyes, it is clear that this was once a uh, handsome young man. Visual lack of interaction. All items. Completely wrapped in bandages like a mummy. Completely covered in a rough dark cloth. Uh, the smell from aldehyde and ink for his corpse is particularly strong. The smell like it was applied recently with good reason. Uh, the This corpse appears to be in an advanced stage of decay. The jaw is missing and some of the flesh has slid off her skull. Revealing the number 1072 chiseled in the bow. This gate looks sealed shut. There is no lock or other means of opening it. Alright. This huge corpse is standing silently in the corner of the room, facing the wall. He looks to have been a heavy set man in his early years, and judging by the condition of his body, he died only recently. The fresh stitch number on his forehead reads 1664. This corpse looks like it is serving as a librarian for it's carrying a huge stack of books in his arms. Uh, let's examine the books. The books appear to be old mortuary ledgers, none of them of any particular interest. As he searched through the text, however, he noticed a loose page folded between two of the books. You're suddenly struck with a feeling that someone tucked in there to hide. We're gonna take it. The page doesn't look like it belongs to the ledger, so it looks like it belongs to the logbook. Here is clean, as if with a knife, so you suspect the page was removed on purpose. Take a moment to read through the page. It's a list of dead bodies brought through the mortuary and logged in the receiving room. All the entries appear to be recent arrivals. Uh... And nothing else, so let's go back in our inventory. Receiving log page. Ragged page looks like it was near the cut near sorry. This ragged page looks like it was cut neatly out of a book. It's written in a tight crap script. 16537, fifth night, drunk, chest wound. Because of that, mauling slash abishai, collector pox. Three common spade, no possessions. Uh, 538. Fifth night. Desiccated corpse. Cause of death. Indeterminable. Age of shell prevents identification. Collector Ferrod. Three common spade. No possession. Stripped. Knife marks evident from the section. Uh, fifth, uh, 539. Fifth night. Scared shell. Cause of death. Indeterminable. 
Uh, scares and appear to be cause of death. Shock trauma? Collector Fera, 3 common spade. Position slot. First, Fist Irons, 13 commons, middle table, receiving room. Uh, number 40, the desiccated corpse number 2, cause of death in the terminable, again, Farad, possession, slogged. Knife marks evident from the section, but the dissection was not thorough enough. A copper earring found lodged in abdomen. Earring have been locked in the southeast preparation room. Have an initiate from the third circle examine it. It has strange markings, like those on contracted worker number 79. Uh, Fifth Knight, Skeleton, Cause of Death, Indeterminable, uh, Farah, Three Common Spain, No Possessions. As in the previous entries, these shells Farah have brought also show signs of having been prepared. If asked into that initiate Emmerich, launch an investigation into the matter. Furthermore, entry 16542 is one of Farah's gang. I've seen the, the individual before. I would ask Emmerich to pay heed of how the man died. Which is the next one. Uh, tiefling male, because of that slash marks, discoloration of wounds are consistent with grave rot. Gold claws? Uh, okay. Sounds like a lovely chap, this Farad. The stench coming from this corpse is truly nauseating. Someone split open this man's chest and has yet to remove all of his internal organs. Hi, Venom. You see a slight young woman with pale features. The sunken flesh around her cheeks and neck makes her appear as if she is starving. She seems intent on dissecting the corpse in front of her, prodding the chest with a finger. Greetings. Ivan. The woman does not respond. She seems too intent on the body in front of her. As you watch her work, you suddenly notice her hands. Her fingers, her talons. They are dirting in and out of the corpse's chest cavity like knives, removing organs. I said greetings. The one makes some response. Morting. I think the dusty chit might be a short of listen oh, sorry. I think the dusty chit might be a bit short of hearing, Chief. Let's lay up, shall we? What's wrong with her hands? Updated my journal. Hey, she's a tiefling, Chief. They got bean blood in their veins. Usually custom ancestor of theirs shared knickers with one demon or another. Make some of them addled in the head and add a looking too. Let's quick save. And then actually tap her. The woman jumps and whips Sarah out to face you. Her eyes are rotting yellow with small orange dots or pupils. As she sees you, her expression changes from surprise to irritation and she frowns at you. Uh, greetings. She doesn't seem to have heard you. She leans forward, squinting as if she can't quite make out. Whatever is wrong with her eyes must make her terribly nearsighted. You. She clacks her talon fingers together and makes a strange motion with her hands. Find thread and embalming juice. Bring here to Ivy. Go, go, go. Uh, I had some questions Updated first. Updated my journal. She turns away. She makes no sign that she heard you. Uh, I met a... Oh. Uh... I met a dust woman in Balmer named Ivy in the mortuary. In addition to her talon hands and tallow colored flesh, she was near sighted and deaf and mistook me for a zombie. She ordered me to go find her a jar of embalming fluid and some needle and thread, presumably for stitching up the corpse on the table in front of her. There must be some around the mortuary somewhere, perhaps in one of the adjoining rooms. Apparently, the dust woman in Balmer encountered the Tifla, someone with a fiendish blood in her veins. Apparently, the fiendish blood warps their bodies and, in some rare cases, their minds as well. From what Morte said, it sounded like there are a number of tieflings about, which would imply a fair number of fiends as well. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep searching, I guess.
Okay, it's sort of a wheel that we're going around. Family Corpse gives it to you with vacant eyes. Number 81 is carved in his forehead and his lips have been stitched closed. Uh, anything interesting going on? Is it dressed as a zombie? It blinks in surprise. Eh? What? Why are you disguised as a corpse? Updated my journal. The zombie is trying to respond beyond his stitched lips. His peculiar half frightened, half angry expression. Who are you? Or who are you? Um. Who are you? Zombie doesn't seem to have heard you. He looks up and down for a few moments and frowns. Or who go here? He's asking her suspiciously. Who far grafters? I'm not a spy. I got sealed in here by accident. Can you help me out? Yeah, he sat for a moment and not slightly as if he couldn't understand it. Or for a horrible. Maybe we could help each other out. What do you want to return? Um, alright, where is this key? He points at his eyes. In a mixed emotion with his hands, that reminds you of a pair of cutting shears. Uh, a dustman woman with yellow eyes and blades on her fingers already met for a new embalming room. Hold on, I'll be back with a key shortly. Updated my journal. I got your damn key, but you best watch your threats, you hear me? Oh. All the talking to zombies did eventually pay off, I guess. Um, okay. Let's check out this room a little bit more closely. Heavily stitched corpse, shuffling back and forth. The number 506 has been stitched on his forehead, and the stud of his neck and its right arm. In fact, the skin of this peeling corpse has been sewn up with so many stitches that its skin looks like a bizarre street map. The stitches encircle the, curb, the corpse, running from its arms across its chest and up its neck, and into the damp mass of white hair. As you follow the crossroad of stitches, you notice someone has jammed the needle into the corpse's forehead. The needle is attached to a thread sti uh, stitching up the side of the skull. You could probably unravel it if you had something to cut the thread. Uh, come to stitch it with a scalpel. Uh, you slice the thread neatly with a scalpel and pluck out the needle and pull the stitches out. As you do, the skin covering the forehead peels back to reveal the corpse's chalk white skull, where to your surprise, the number 78 has been chiseled. Seems you got two different designations there, corpse. Corpse contain murky liquid. It smells like a cross between vinegar and vinegar. Vinegar and formaldehyde. Not a corpse on a stone slab. There is no indication of what the body died of. This chalk white body has been drained of blood and treated with bowling fluid. A nearly stitched seam runs down the corpse's chest. Is of this corpse are set close together and the eyeballs themselves are slightly askew. One face is left and the other to the right. You can barely make out the number 257 traced into the bruised forehead. Looks like the corpse has taken several blows to the head, making the number difficult to read. Uh, okay. Usual lack of interaction. We found the needle and thread. On the table is still fresh. Another stench rising from the body. Red blood covers the surface. Rotten corpse is riddled with tubes. A yellow liquid is cycling through a tube into a stranger machine. The machine is making clicking noises like an insect. Ah, there we go. The 
lose our stairs going up, or we... We're gonna finish the quest on this level for sure. The door is locked and we need a key. Oh, more embalming. I'll take it. Here we have a locked container. Also locked. Alright, so. Can I try move from the. No, but I could easily move the screen that way. Alright, here you go. Uh, tap her. Actually, let's first watch her study the motion of her hands. Updated my journal. As you study the motion of Ivine's hands, you feel a prickling along your scalp, and then suddenly you find your vision swimming, blurring, until... You're standing in front of a fresh slain corpse. Rigor Mort is making mockery of its smile. The number 42 has been stitched onto a scalp. The zombie is lying on the slab, and you just finished stitching up its chest. You've placed something inside, something that may prove useful if you come this way again. Echo. Keep those things safe and wait for my return. The memory, the memory of your voice is an echo, strange and hollow to your ears. You cross your arms in front of your chest, and to your surprise, the corpse does too. After a moment, its hands fall back to its sides, and as it does, the vision fades. And you're watching Ivy's hands make their stitching motions one more, once more. Uh, okay, no. Looking for Corpse 42. Tapper. Uh, okay. I will say, wait a minute. Make a wish of a key turning with your hand. I need an embalming key. Do you have one? She leans forward, looks at your hand motions, then sniffs. Her hand darts into a robe that emerges, a key hanging from her wickedly sharp index finger. She flicks it into your hand. Bring back one duck. Go. Updated my journal. Tap her. Give her the thread and embalming fluid. Updated my journal. Without missing a beat, Ivine snaps the thread from your hands and hooks it around one of her talents and begins to swing up the corpse's chest. She then takes the embalming fluid and begins applying a layer to the corpse. Wait. Within minutes, she's finished. She clicks her talents and turns to face you. To your surprise, she extends her hands and drags her talents along your arms and chest. Oh, it's not that I'm not flattered, but... Looks like you have a new friend, Chief. You two need some time together, or... Let's go in, Morte. As she traces your arms and chest, you suddenly notice she seems to be examining your scars. She withdraws her talons, she clicks them twice, then bends forward and examines some of the tattoos on your chest. Hmm, you're right on you. Cavers do that. No respect for zombies. Zombies, not painting. She sniffs, then pokes one of your scars. This one, bad shape. Many scars, no preserves. Your talent suddenly you hook into the thread you brought her, and lightning like she jabs on her talent into the skin near one of your scars. It feels barely more than a pinprick, but it looks like she's about to start stitching you up. Yeah, sure, let her Updated work. Updated my journal. The sensation is curiously painless as Ivine brings us begins to stitch up your scars. Uh, when she's done, she sniffs you frowns and stabs her fingers into the bobbing fluid. Within minutes, she has doubled your body with the fluid, and strangely enough, it makes you feel better. We got one more max HP for it. Morte. This is maybe the second time in my life that I'm thankful I don't have a nose. Ivine puts the last touches on your body, gives you another sniff, nods, and makes you a shrink motion with her talents. Done. Go, go. Um, okay. Um... I now kind of want to go back through all the zombies and see if we can find the number 42. This corpse 985 is stopped dead in its tracks. Judging from the condition of its left leg, it looks as if some sort of tomb, tomb broth or corpse mold has eaten through its knee. The corpse is wobbling unsteadily back and forth, trying to keep his balance. Trying to help the corpse balance. You reach out for the corpse's left arm to help steady it. As you grab its arm, however, the corpse suddenly sways to the right, and you end up tending the corpse rather than setting it. Ooh. Or, Chief, you might not... Zombie worker. There's a crack for the corpse's left leg, and the body falls like a dead tree. 
Its dorsal strikes the stone flagstones and shatters like a rotten melon, felt an acor gurgling from the cavity. To your surprise, no one seems to have noticed the corpse's collapse. And even stranger, the left leg remains standing where the body was as if at, at attention. After a moment, the leg falls over with a wet thump. As you get upon the putrefied remains of the corpse, you notice that its left arm seems intact. It had snapped from the torso during the fall and it doesn't appear to have been touched by the tomb rod that spread through the rest of the body. Hmm, I wonder if I could make use of that arm. So we just got... Oh, no, we can just loot a left arm, I guess. Uh, let's read our journal. We have left our journal a little unread. One of the zombies on the second floor of the mortuary wasn't a zombie at all, but a man in disguise. But would anyone disguise themselves as a zombie is beyond me. In exchange for the zombie's help, I agreed to get an embalming key from the dust woman and Balmer that I met in the other room. Ivine, I think her name was. How could she possibly use an embalming key with those blades of her hands is beyond me. Watching Ivine stitch up the corpse with her talents triggered a strange memory. I recall performing a similar operation on a corpse long ago, except that I think I was placing something inside its chest rather than taking something out. It felt like I was putting whatever it was in there so I could retrieve it later. In the memory, when I crossed my arms, the corpse itself crossed its arms as well. It had the number 42 written on its skull. I convinced Ivine to give me the embalming key. I delivered the embalming fluid and threat to Ivine. She didn't seem terribly grateful. After I delivered the embalming fluid and threat to Ivine, she stitched up my scars and applied the embalming fluid on my body. Strangely enough, it made me feel healthier. Uh, 257. I, I have to accidentally clicked off. Um, I don't think it's any of the... Okay, so one thing that I really need to do now... To increase the mouse scrolling speed. That's a lot better. This guy. One six six four. I don't think we've met it, but I want to check before we move on. Seven two. Ninety six. Oh, one. Nine six. Corner. Oh. Nine six five. Okay, no, we we know about uh, the row of three, so that's fine. Two six. Five nine four. Five six nine. Yeah, I think all of them had three digits to their number. Oh, and hey, I haven't seen it. Let's let's go down this way, I guess, since we've come all the way around. Though I guess it probably just wraps around. Oh, or not? Uh, okay, we talked to everybody, so let's go back here. There you go. Greetings. 
I have some questions for you. Um, how'd you get to look like that? Guys, we also got scars. We were rot on bottom of Freud. We make good zombie. Zombie giggles through stretched lips, then taps his head. Just as stupid. Morte. Yeah, dare the stupid ones, alright. Zombie worker. The sarcasm is evident to the last of the zombie who nods eagerly. Stupid justice. We were good zombie. Doesn't that hurt? It looks at your scars. I ask you some questions. Eh, or not very much. Off his chest. Me, tough. This guess is pretty good. Can you disguise me as a zombie? He looks you up and down for a few moments, mumbling to himself and nods. Uh -uh. We were driving by the fruit. Lots of the scars on your chest. Good old fruit. Um. I'll think about it. I had some other questions. Do you know someone named Farad? Farad? Zombie frowns brief and thought. We. Her her fell in heart somewhere. He shakes his head. Not nowhere. Runs again. Just as far as you read, they don't like Farad. Why don't the dustmen like Farad? Updated my journal. Who's a collector? Brings debtors to mortuary. Sells them to dustmen. Brings lots of debtors. Dustmen does not know where he gets debtors. Thinks he's putting barracks in dead book. Uh, what? Morte. He's saying this ferret Burke has been selling a lot of debtors, corpses to the dustmen. That's what collectors do, they get a dead body and sell them to the dustmen. Sounds like this ferret's been selling so many debtors that the dustus thinks he's been putting hivers in the dead book before their hour is up. You know, killing people. Uh, I see. There was something else I wanted to know. Can you tell me anything about Dal? Bribe. Drugs. Or Yarrow. Nothing more to be said, I suppose. I wanted to know something else. I'm missing a journal. Have you seen it? Journal. From work for you? Uh, what? Morte. He wants to know if somebody robbed you. Probably what happened. Uh, okay. Uh, don't go anywhere. Let's give him his key. The zombie's eyes widen as he snatches the key from your hand. He turns it over, nodding all the while. Burr, burr. Now, how do I get out of Updated here? Updated my journal. The zombie grunts. We could have kept your portals. He waves his hands. Oof. Portals? What portals? Portals. The zombie waves around the area. Portals everywhere. Can you show me one of those portals? The zombie nods. If you want art, we go through our trip for floor. First horse room. You need finger bowl, shape of crook. He holds up his inner fingers and bends like a crook. When you have key, go to arch, jump to secret crap, and then can escape from there. You can escape route. He nods eagerly. You can rest there. You get finger bowl? Where am I gonna find one of these? Updated my journal. He shrugs. Must be one rough somewhere. Look at storage room on upper floor. Maybe there. Uh, alright, I had some other questions. Uh, can you disguise me as a zombie? Actually, what quick save? I got the zombie thing. Uh, okay. Oh, I don't have the thread anymore. That's the thing, right? Yeah, I still got the involvement form, but I don't have the thread. Uh... The sealed jar involvement fluid is used to as preservatives for dead bodies. As an added benefit, the smell of the fluid is more than sufficient to mask the smell of any rotting bodies it is used on. Effects are temporary. I don't know why I have two different bandages. This one heals three hit points. Oh, okay. I can stack them. 
Um, alright. Um, uh, okay. So, I can do anything until, unless I got the stitching with him. So I guess we're just gonna go upstairs. I'm gone. Oh, this is, uh... We are roaring from the mouth of this immense furnace is incredibly hot. Walking even a few steps past the archway will certainly cause your hair and flesh to burst in flame. The skeleton number 748, according to the number chiseled above its brow, is odd only in that some of its teeth appear to be false ones made of reddish-brown stone. They're clearly not valuable, however, as its caretakers would have otherwise removed them. I have to ask, why this mock? I mean, it's not like you have anything to be modest about. Great talking to you, Bones. Stay healthy. More tip. Hmm, wonder if this Greybeard would mind if I borrowed his body. Greybeard? Greybeard. You know, geezer, old fellow, yellow dog. Old. Well, I'm thinking he's in a position to object. Why not take his body? Morte studies the skeleton for a moment and shakes his head. Nah, I need a fresher one than this, and something with a little more dignity. One that's not all creaky and fractured. And you're not? Oh, you're a sack full of laughs. More to glares at you. Besides, you're one to talk, Burke. Mirrors begs for mercy when you're around. Let's go. There's a bunch of dust people roaming around. Okay, well, I guess, uh, talk to everybody, right? Skeleton seems particularly old, the leather straps binding it together have cracked and worn. The word repent has been carefully engraved into its forehead with a small some amount of skill. A rougher hand later chiseled 996 on both its temples. Examine him carefully. Someone has taken care to bind the bones of the skeleton with leather straps woven around the body in such a pattern that they resemble muscles and tendons. The straps are secured to metal bolts punched into the skeleton's joints. The skeleton looks like it has seen a great deal of service. Many of its bones are chipped and its numerous fractures are bound with sealant and false metal glues. I wanted to try proud skeleton's joint bolts. Warranty goes, Whoa, chief, that's vandalism. Those bolts probably are the only thing holding that bag of bones together. Necromancy only goes so far with these old fellows. Oh, I didn't want to cause any permanent damage. Oh, it's not a problem. Warranty does a strange bobbing motion that you think might be a shrug. I wasn't sure if you knew that or not. By all means, go ahead. Nah. Now with some dusties. Are you lost? No, I'm not lost. I had some questions. If you're not lost, what is your business here? I'm here to see someone. Who are you here to see? It is none of your concern. I'm afraid that it is my concern. We have the guards can loosen your tongue. Dustman takes a step back. She looks like she's about to summon the guards. Bad call. So the most recent quick save. The auto save here, I think. Yeah. All right. But by the way, is there a way down? Because done. I guess this is the way down. I'm gone. Purple charm. Uh, charm bone fragment of some creature. Symbols are engra engraved. It protects you against flames and extreme heat. Actually, equip that. Oh, it's a quick item. Okay. Uh, examine the skeleton carefully. We're gonna leave it in peace.
Pardon me, have you seen a skeleton walking around here? Great time to you, Boons. Save successful. We're waiting. A guard comes. Oh, I think they want to fight me. Hell no. Uh, I'm here to see someone. I'm here to see Dal. Very well, thanks. Done. Alright, I guess that's how we evade that. Uh, 475. Nothing interesting going on with the Scorps. Walking weird. Uh, skin of female corpse typically for two intricate patterns. Uh, skin of her brow has been peeled back, so her number 1148 could be chiseled into the skull beneath. Her mouth is sealed shut. How about this guy? 1146 leaves us soon together with coarse buck thread. Your entire body is covered in horrible scars, worse even than your own, as if the owner had been burned to death. His nose, ears, and several digits are missing, presumably charred uh, away in some long ago conflagration. As you block its path and gets its attention, it stops and gazes at you with vacant eyes. Usual nothing. Skeleton worker has seen a great deal of combat or has fallen down on one too many staircases, but its arm and legs have been broken and rebuilt with the aid of leather straps and thin iron rods. The front of its skull bears a number 863, but the back of the skull has been caved in, forming an empty cavity. Uh, someone has stuck a piece of parchment inside the skull. We take it. Uh, up enough, it feels the skull cavity is intended to store messages. A tiny string is attached to the parchment from a hook bolted inside the skull, as if to keep the parchment from accidentally falling out. You unhook the string and glance over the parchment. It looks like a reminder from one of the mortuary custodians. Judging from the note, the skeleton seems to be a walking messenger of sorts. As you take a second glance at the skeleton, you realize it has stopped in front of the slab because you can figure out how to move past it. Uh, okay, let's leave him in peace for a second. Read this, uh, no. Mortuary reminder. To scroll the piece of parchment appears to be some sort of message the skeleton in the mortuary was supposed to deliver. This is the third and last request for the pry bar. If it has been misplaced, if it has been misplaced, tell me, and I shall go to the hive market and purchase another. I have no objection to maintaining the contracted workers, but I've been trying to repair the skeletons, and the bolts are wedged in so tight I can get them out. Also, some of the locks in the storage cabinets on the third floor have become stuck again due to the heat, and I need the pry bar to snap them open as well. If the pry bar is indeed lost, I will see about procuring the services of a locksmith and having the cabinet be replaced. Your aid in the matter is most appreciated, and there's an unreadable signature. Uh, let's uh, help the skeleton. Uh. Help it? Maybe we need to examine it carefully first. Ah, let's just leave it like this. Locked. We already talked. I'm here to see someone. I'm here to see it all. Yes, thanks for the information. You're the one who stopped me, dude. Like. Some chill. Uh, that's our stuck friend. What about this friend? What's in here? Oh. Mortuary task list. Someone has spent a series of tasks in a red ink on the scrap of parchment. I would like the contracted workers to be inspected thrice daily at the end of each work shift when the new initiates come on duty. We've experienced too many contract collapses while engaged in heavy labor as of late. And I fear the embalming enchantments initially used on the corpses may be decaying or warped somehow. Contracted workers could be inspected every eight hours if rays of death collapsed, and this would prevent the backlog of shells in the preparation rooms and free up more contracted workers for their duties. 
I do not wish collapsed bodies to be disposed of. When possible, the originally contracted shells are to be erased and be made to resume their duties. I've included some spare embalming charms with shells for initiate some duty. They are to be used only when the shells cannot be repaired when stitching, bandaging, or applications of embalming fluid. And I'll take it. No, I'm not lost. I'm here to see someone. I'm here to see Dal. Thank you very much. Stop fucking bugging me. Oh, 42. We found him. Skeleton turns face you. Forty-two has been chiseled into its forehead and a number of its bones, mostly the jaws and the joints, have been bound on other straps. Uh, okay. Uh, no. I think this is the corpse I had the memory about. At the sound of your voice, the skeleton suddenly straightens up. It crosses its arms over its chest and its fingers hook into its ribcage. Press your arms over your chest. In response, the skeleton drops its arms to its sides. The ladder cord securing the skeleton stirs a snap, and the ribcage folds outward like a pair of double doors. Reach into it. To your surprise, your hand vanishes as you reach inside the ribcage. You have a strange feeling it's somewhere else. As you reach inside the ribcage, your hand bumps against an invisible object. It's about the size of a fist that seems to be attached to the skeleton's spine. Take it out. As you pull the item out, the skeleton suddenly disintegrates, and the iron bolts securing its joints clatter on the floor. Whatever this item was, it seems to have been the only thing holding it together. Looks like an unremarkable lump of iron. You can't imagine why someone would hide it inside the ribcage of a skeleton. As you place both your hands on the lump of iron to examine it, there is a hiss, and the metal evaporates, leaving behind a strange dagger, a handful of coins wrapped in a dirty cloth, and two bloody teardrops. Looks like these were inside the lump of iron. Finally, in the wasteland of Avernus, this particular green ore can be tempered into a metal much lighter than normal steel. In addition, green steel weapons have retained their remarkably fine edges and are capable of dealing out more damage than their standard counterparts. It probably beats the scalpel. One to three piercing. One to four piercing. Clutch ram heals 9 HP, adds resistance to slashing attacks. Mortuary Sanctum Key. This heavy key is a strange fusion of bone and unfathomable blood red metal. Its jagged C shaped head looks like it's ready to. Uh, clamp down on whoever holds it. The key is used to open the inner gates in the mortuary. Hell yeah. Let's make a save. Can't rename it or anything, huh? I think the odds of this key opening the cabinet in the back is pretty low. Jump. We'll take it because we're hoarders. Oh, needle and thread. There we go. I'm still locked. Oh, 
Oh god, again? No, I'm not lost. I'm here to see someone. I'm here to see Dal. Oh, very well, thank you. Yes, please. Best man request. A note written on the scrap of dry parchment. Contact the necromancer responsible for raising contract order 42. I know he's examined a skeleton before, but I'm certain the initial raising of the body was warped. The worker has still responds to commands, but when it has completed a task, it resumes pacing in the same circular pattern as it did before. Not recently informed me that the worker 42 exhibited the same walking pattern when it was a zombie decades ago. There may be a soul echo in the marrow of the skeleton's age that may have caused the magic on animating him to decay. One of the initiates suggested it may be following an order issued by a higher ranking dustman in the past, but I found no records of such an order. Whatever the reason for its behavior, the matter is to be resolved or the worker replaced. Oh. Um, were we a dustman? Who knows? Uh, zombie worker with cell number 79. Wait. Corpse's meaty head was clearly severed at some point and hastily sewn back on. Several different sets of stitching, all in various states of unraveling, seem to indicate that the head is constantly being knocked back off and reattached during the course of its work. The number has begun in its temple, circumcised by a fank circle that appears to have been branded on its forehead. The fank circle looks like it was branded on the corpse's forehead long ago, presumably before it died. It might be a religious icon of some sort, or a rite of passage. You notice that one of the recesses between the inner fang has a small triangle within it, as if it has some special significance. Updated my journal. Uh, we ask about the mark, but there's of course no report. Vex has told me there's a secret folder in the northwest room of the first floor of the mortuary. If you take a crooked finger bone up to it, it will activate and take me to the secret crypt, where Vax says I can't rest. He doesn't know where I could find a crooked finger bone, however, but he suggested I try the upper floor of the mortuary. Mm, stitches, 679. Responsive. Uh, Generated skeleton smells horrible as if it had been only freshly stripped and prepared. Uh, the number 1221 has been chiseled on its forehead. Let me, let me make a quick save. Preparing out the bolts. Using the fry bar. Get a club. Six one three, but an inch of shredded leathery skin separates the one and the three. But closer, you can barely make out a two carved here. So I'm here to see someone, I'm here to see Dal. Thank you for the information. I don't know how to interact it with the pry bar, so let's just leave it be. And a quick save. Oh, 
against a wooden club. Like, my reasoning is that one of them must have a crooked finger bone. Oh, I don't want one going so far. The scrolling is a little bit weird because I'm playing windowed. Not as responsive as I would like it to be. Back to this one, right? Um. Oh, there's stairs on. Wait, there's stairs? Oh. Oh! I not even realized. It's literally just where I started. And here are the stairs down. All right. You see a certain man looking in black robes, so look at you suspiciously. You seem to have gotten turned around in these halls. Are there any guys around who can direct visitors? Thank you for your assistance. I will go speak with the guy. Done. Zombie number eight nine one. Oh, it's nothing else. Can I open this? Oh, yeah, okay. Let me try out the zombie thing now. Greetings. I have some question for you first. Can you disguise me as a zombie? Here you go. Morte. Can't believe you're going through with this. How barmy are you? Pretty barmy, I suppose. The zombie liberally applies the embalming fluid to your body, then stitches up several of your scars. Working from your feet upwards, he stitches up your scars and finishes up the disguise by stitching your lips. Mm -hmm. Can you make the stitches on his lips any tighter? The zombie holds up his hand. Careful! Talk full of stitches out. Ruins disguise. Zombie no talk. You good to talk? Talk slow. Careful. Okay. Mm -hmm, I understand. Updated my journal. Zombie frowns. Your scars won't last long. All better than trying to dry up stitches far out. He shrugs. Probably not last a sub or two areas. I know it, Ronnie. You run, you ruin a whole disguise. Oh, okay. Now the game leave. Let me make a quick save. Just in case. Yeah. Oh boy. Oh, I don't know if I can handle this. I'm gone. I mean, it's effective for sure. to explore while the nameless one stays behind. Heavy metal pipes run from the floor into the wall. Heavy barred of gate rusted shut. No ways of opening it. Uh, 
and it starts blocking me. I guess it can't rotate, so I don't know. But... Here. We'll do our best to maintain this disguise. Just because I really like the dustman not really bugging me. Ooh, that's a lot of weapons. Some hatchet. Buckle, yeah, we're definitely dealing with uh, first edition D and D. Looking for the corpse of my friend. What did they say in the journal? Turn in a memorial hall on the first floor. Black on the beer says, Here lies Dionara. Oh, this was the woman that we saw in the opening movie, isn't it? Um, you see a strikingly beautiful ghost form before you. Her arms are crossed and her eyes are closed. She has long flowing hair and her gown seems stirred by the use of material breeze. As you watch, she stirs slightly and her eyes flicker. Greetings. You! What is it that brings you here? Have you come to see firsthand the misery you have wrought? Perhaps in death I still hold some shred of use for you. My my love, do I know you? Spirit makes a begging motion with her hands. How can it be that the thieves of the mind continue to steal my name from your memory? Do you not remember me, my love? The ghost stretches out her arms. Think. Her voice becomes desperate again. The name Dionara must have evoked some memory within you. I think I feel the stirrings of memory. Tell me more. Perhaps your words shall chase the shadows from my mind, Dionara. Oh, at last the fates show mercy. Even death cannot chase me from your mind, my love. Do you not see? Your memories shall return. Tell me how I can help, and I shall. I need to escape this place. Can you help me? As you're about to ask Yonara the question, it catches in your throat. It occurs to you that if you tell her you're looking for an escape route, she may feel like you're abandoning her. If you're going to ask her how to leave, you need to be delicate about it. Uh, let's start by being some more questions. Who are you? I can be okay. We did this. Yep, we did this already. You know who I am? You are one but blessed and cursed, my love, and you are one who is never far from my thoughts and heart. Blessed and cursed? What do you mean? The nature of your curse should be apparent, my love. Look at you. She points at you. Death rejects you. Your memories have abandoned you. Do you not pause and wonder why? Uh, I'm still trying to get my bearings, actually. What else can you tell me about myself? I know that you once claimed you loved me and that you would love me until death claimed us both. I believe that. I believe that. Never knowing the truth of who you were and what you were. And what am I? You, I, cannot. She suddenly freezes and she speaks slowly, carefully, as if her voice frightens her. The truth is this. 
You are one who dies many deaths. These deaths have given the knowing of all things mortal, and in your hand lies the spark of life and death. Those that die near you carry a trace of themselves that you can bring forth. As Dionara speaks the words, a crawling sensation wells up in the back of your skull. You suddenly feel compelled to look at your hand. As you lift it up and look at it, you can see the blood coursing sluggishly through your arm, pouring into your muscles, and in turn giving strength to your bones. Whoa. Updated my journal. And you know Dionara is right. You suddenly remember how to coax it in the spark of life from a body and bring it forth. The thought both horrifies and intrigues you. No, you remember how to raise others from the dead. To access this ability, select the special abilities button in the quick menu. You can only use this on party members that have died in your presence. It will not work on anyone who does not travel with you, and it will not work on party members if you're removed from the party while they are dead. Uh, can you tell me where I am? Where are you? While well, you're here with me, my love. As in the times when life was something both of us shared. Now it is the eternal boundary that separates us. Eternal boundary? In our sun seventh. Barrier of fear you shall never cross, my love. It is the barrier between your life and what remains of mine. Uh, other questions? Let's see, you escape again and tell her, I am in danger. Can you get me to a place of safety? I shall return as soon as I can speak to you again. In danger? Dianara looks concerned. Of course, my love, I will aid you any way I can. She closes her eyes for a moment, and you watch her material zephyr pass through her body, stirring her hair. After a moment, the zephyr dies, and her eyes slowly open. Perhaps there is a way. Yes? I sense that this place holds many doors shrouded from mortal eyes. Perhaps you could use one of these portals as a mean of escape. Portals. Uh, portals are holes in existence, leading to destinations in the inner and outer planes. If you could find a proper key, you could escape through one of them. Key? In our pause for a moment as if attempting to remember. Portals will reveal themselves when you have the proper key. Unfortunately, these keys can be almost anything. An emotion, a piece of wood, a dagger of silver glass, a scrap of cloth, a tune you hum to yourself. Spirit and the dustmen are the only ones who would know the keys you could use to leave the halls, my love. Um, okay. I will return. Hold a moment. I learn much when I travel with you, my love, and what you have lost. I have retained. I have not divulged all that I know to you. My sight is clear while you fumble in the darkness for sparks of thought. What is it that your sight sees that I do not? Time itself relaxes its hold as the chills of oblivion slowly claim us, my love. Lives and things yet to come swarm across my vision. I see you, my love. I see you as you are now, and... In our grist quiet. What is it? What do you see? I see what lies ahead of you. It ripples through the plains, stemming outward from this point. Shall I speak of what I see? Tell me. First, I require a promise. I promise you will return, that you will find some means to save me or join me. I like, I like playing the scorned lover. I find it hard to believe that a woman I once loved would blackmail promises from me with a promise of revelations. Have you no faith in me, Dionara? Dionara looks taken aback, then her tone changes, her voice becomes almost pleading. I I don't mean to extract a vow from you, my love. It is just that I have waited so long for you to join me beyond... Uh... If you do not mean to extract a vow from me, Dionara, then, you do not, then do not do so. Now tell your vision we will speak no more vows of, oh, no more of vows and promises. Dinara stiffens. He looks as if she's about to say something that sighs in defeat. Very well, my love. As before, I shall have to place my trust in you. This is what my eyes see, my love. Unfettered by the shackles of time. You shall meet enemies three, but none more dangerous than yourself in your full glory. They are shades of evil, of good, and of neutrality given life and twisted by the laws of the plains. You shall come to a prison built of regrets and sorrow, where the shadows themselves have gone mad. There you will be asked to make a terrible sacrifice, my love. For the matter to be laid to rest, you must destroy that which keeps you alive and be immortal no longer. 
This road keeps me alive. I know that you must die while you still can. The circle must come to a close, my love. You are not meant for this life. You must find that which was taken from you and travel beyond into the lands of the dead. Updated my journal. Travel well, I still can. I cannot doubt your ability to rise from the dead. We believe that every incarnation weakens your thoughts and memories. You claim you have lost your memory. Perhaps it is a side effect of countless deaths? If so, what more will you lose in successive deaths? You lose your mind. You will not know even know enough to realize that you cannot die. You shall truly be doomed. Countless deaths? How long has this been going on? I do not truly know that it has gone on quite long enough. Um, alright. Here I well. shall wait for you in death's halls, my love. He smiles, but there is only sadness in it. She closes her eyes, and with an ethereal whisper, she fades. Morton. You back with me, chief? Kind of drifted out on me there. You know, I'm fine. You know who that spirit was? Eh, yeah, spirit? Spectre I was talking to, the woman. You were rattling your bone box at some woman? Where? Morta looks around, excited. What did she look like? It was around top of the beer. Didn't you see her? Uh, no. You just kind of drifted out for a bit there. You just stood there, statue-like. I was a little worried you'd gotten addled on me again. No, I'm fine, I think. Let's move on. I feel stronger. Ooh, we just leveled up. And we have nothing to choose, I guess. Uh, fighting skills have improved. One characteristic points gained, nine hit points gained. Looks like it accept. Oh, okay. Oh, because, oh, the zombie is guys. That's cute. Um... I don't want to boost my charisma. Yeah, I'll boost my charisma once more. We are currently true neutral. Oh wow, there's a character biography. Um, I think oh, he's also almost ready to uh, level up. Our experience is much. We're level four. Jesus. Um. All right. I I think this is uh, a good spot to call it. What was her name? Yanara. Oh. Yanara, Dianara. Um. So yeah, thank you for watching this first episode of our Planescape Tournament playthrough uh, for Classical Studies. Uh, definitely a very good game. I can see why people like it. Um, I still wish we figured out how to escape the mortar yet. I guess you know, back in the day, games had a much slower buildup. Uh, but I'm excited to keep going. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for watching this. Make sure to check out twitch.tv slash games with Nick, where we are playing every Tuesday and Thursday some games. Um, typically Tuesday is more of a more recent game and Thursday is a retro game, but check out the current schedule. Uh, and then also make sure to check out uh, the original channel that I had, youtube.com slash at games with Nick. Plenty of uh, full playthroughs on there, even of some older stuff like the full Gabriel Knight series and some good point and click adventures. Um, yeah, so uh, the nameless one here says goodbye to you. Thank you for watching. Uh, and this is Nick signing off saying, let's keep retro playing together.